We are in session six. six. Of course, we wrapped up our study through the book of Acts, and we are going to go elsewhere. I'm not sure where, but uh, obviously, you know, we've been in some crazy uh, weeks uh, these last couple of months. And uh, then, of course, there's usually a downturn during the summer where our attendance drops off. Of course, ours dropped off because we quit having church for about a month, and now we're in the process of building it back up. Last week, we had great numbers and great services, and we just trust that things will continue to, uh, to increase. But uh, we are going to start another verse-by-verse study here in the very near future. I'm really trying to settle on, on where we want to go. Uh, by the way, I'm looking forward to, uh, to this week's uh, s- sermon. Dan is going to be, uh, he's going to postpone uh, the uh, sermon on falling away to the following week. This week, he's going to preach a Father's Day message challenging men as to where, you know, where have all the men gone? Where are the real men? So, men, let's be here. Let's be here in mass this Sunday. Let's bring our, our sons and let's bring our brothers and friends and neighbors to be here for what will be an inspiring and, I believe, challenging sermon. And pray that, pray that somehow, some way, God will use this as another brick in the wall that, that he is building. Well, session number six, we are dealing tonight with the Declaration in the Constitution. Of course, biblical worldview we talk about uh, four realms of government. And there's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. And the truth is, every issue that we face today, whether it be gender identity, cross-dressing, homosexuality, baby murder, uh, any other sin, uh, it didn't just happen in the last hundred years. This has been around since literally uh, the early parts of the, quite frankly, the time prior to the flood, and that's what brought about the first judgment, or global judgment. But if we would take every issue and we would apply it to one of four realms of governing, then that is, in fact, a biblical worldview, and we find that things work fabulously well. Of course, it begins with self-government. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, your body is your most prized personal possession. Take care of it. It's up to you to decide what you put into your body and how you treat it. You also are the sole person responsible for the consequences of those decisions. You know, I find every day I wake up and I'm suffering from the consequences of deciding to play football many years ago. You know, it's nobody else's fault but mine. At the age of 57... You know, I was blessed, what I thought was a blessing to be able to play professional football, boy, I pay for it every day now. I feel like I got hit by a truck, and the driver stopped to see what he had hit and backed over me when he was trying to find out what he'd hit. But anyway, self-government. Then there's family government. Of course, the Bible says that parents are entrusted with raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It was a foolproof plan. One generation teach the next generation. Folks, that should have been bulletproof if we had just done our job. And the reality is the parents are supposed to provide for the care of their children. And then as the children are full grown and the parents aged, it was the children's responsibility to make sure that their parents were cared for in their senior years. Then the area of the church, the ecclesia. You know, one of the primary responsibilities that we have handed over to the civil governing authority is that of charity. In fact, we don't even have charity anymore. We have this welfare state, which we have created by implementing acts of socialism, where we take from those that work hard and budget and save and give entitlement programs to those that refuse to work. The reality is all of us go through hard times at, at times in life. All of us are going to need help at some point. But that's, you know, the old American Express commercial that said membership has its privileges. You know, there's a great blessing to be a part of a, of a local congregation. And the reality is it was up to the church body to take care of itself when there was needs from one member of the body. And the only area of responsibility that the Bible had entrusted to the strong sword of civil government was punishing evildoers and protecting those of us that do the right thing that we may live peaceably in all godliness. It doesn't matter whether you look at the advent of government in Genesis 9, 6, or when you look at Romans 13, or 1 Peter 2, or 1 Timothy 2, or, or any other passage that deals with governing, that is God's intent and design for government. Now, we looked in past week on the subject of government, whether God had an ideal. 
and I gave you a great argument, which, by the way, Bill Federer reaffirmed when he was here, that God actually established for the first 400 years with the nation of Israel a constitutional republic. It wasn't a monarchy at all. Then last week we talked about the law. How does it apply to us? And we noted that the law was the constitution for the nation of Israel. And it's comprised of three parts. There's God's morality, which primarily deals with self-government. Uh, the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is, in fact, self-government. Then there was an area called uh, the statutes. And that deals with the... Uh, um, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, then there was an area called the, uh, yeah, the, the uh, statutes, no, the judgments, I'm sorry, the judgments which dealt with civil law and uh, interaction between people, such things as having a banister on the roof of your house or, or, or digging a latrine outside the camp or no conviction without the testimony of two or three witnesses. And then you also had the statutory law, which in, in the law, uh, the Constitution of Israel dealt with uh, Israel's uh, sacrificial system. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. And the scripture says in Matthew that the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, meaning that we no longer need an earthly high priest after the order of Aaron. We now have a heavenly high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and we can with boldness and confidence enter into God's throne room of mercy and grace because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are no longer bound to keep the sacrificial system. However, the rest of it, we're still obligated to God's morality, which hasn't changed. And then God's uh, judgments as far as civil law, well, a lot of it is a pretty good idea that we ought to consider. In fact, at one time, we did take into consideration the United States of America. Well, let's go back and look real briefly at the, separate, or the difference between the Declaration and the Constitution. And we're going to start with King Henry VIII. By 1533... The Reformation had swept through a good portion of the main continental Europe. However, it hadn't reached the islands of Great Britain. Henry was a devout Catholic. However, he wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, whom he'd been married to some, I believe, 19 years at the time. She had been unable to produce a male heir to the throne, so he wanted to divorce her. He appealed unto the Pope. The Pope said, no dice. So King Henry ultimately said, hang you. I'm going to start my own church and put myself at the top of it. And he started the Anglican Church and the Church of England. Well, he was not only the king, being the political head of the state, but he was also the spiritual leader of the Church of England. His advisors counseled that one way to, to, to affirm this separation from the Roman Church was to publish the Bible in English, which they in fact did. But there were some ramifications that came from that that he obviously didn't anticipate. Once the Bible was written in English, then Englishmen could read it for themselves. And they weren't at the, uh, at the uh, bets of the, uh, the priesthood to tell them what God had for them to do. And if people read the Bible for themselves, they recognized just exactly where the Church of England had strayed. And there were two results from this. One, you had a group of people that wanted to purify the church from within. History calls them the Puritans. Then you had another group that said, we cannot purify the church. We just need to separate out of it and start it biblically, local, congregational, New Testament churches. That group was called the separatists. We know one of those groups very well because they boarded the Mayflower in 1620 and sailed to the New World. Of course, this group was devoted Bible followers. They looked to the pages of Scripture for everything. But they were, other than Jamestown, the first settlers from England into what we know as the New World. Well, over the next hundred years, you had all sorts of, you had Anglicans coming, you had Puritans coming, you had Separatists coming, you had other denominations from other countries coming, but all settling New England, and there were 13 colonies, and the Englishmen had rights under the English law. They were, in fact, free men. They could elect their own houses of burgesses or state legislatures. They could uh, make their own laws. They could tax themselves as they deemed necessary for however much government that they wanted uh, for themselves. They could own property and buy and sell and trade with whomever they chose. And most importantly, though, they had the ability, the freedom in most of the colonies to worship the Lord in spirit and truth as they wish rather than being subject to the whim of the Church of England. 
However, over time, there were good kings. There were also bad kings. You had good kings like the, the, the reign of, of William and Mary, bad kings like King Charles and tyranny. And over time, these charters between, the, between England and the colony of Pennsylvania or the colony of Massachusetts or the colony of Rhode Island, over time, these charters were broken illegally. Legislatures were dissolved by the king. Trade was suppressed. Uh, taxes were levied without representation. And please understand this. The way we were designed is we were free people. We decided how much government we wanted, and then we recognized that we had to pay for it somehow. So depending on how much government we wanted to have, we recognized we had to have some sort of taxation to fund that government. But it was up to us, so we decided how much tax to pay. Well, once a king or a monarch or a, 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 a lord says, I am now going to take out of your wallet uh, $5, and that's now legal. Well, if I can legally take $5 from you, why can't I come back and take $500 from you? I mean, quite frankly, there's nothing in your wallet that belongs to me. And if I set a precedent that I can now take $5, I can come back tomorrow and take five more. Or basically, they understood that taxation without representation made themselves slaves to the king of England. So it wasn't the amount of the tax. It was the principle that was involved. And the colonists were brilliant. They understood that this was a, a line that could not be crossed. By the way, it violated English law. Well, these were unpopular acts that these kings made. So in order to inform, enforce their unpopular acts, they wanted to house soldiers in the colonies. When there was no war, we didn't have a war with the Indians, didn't have a war with France. Quite frankly, this was to subjugate the people. This also was a violation of law. Then the kings continued to break more laws. Finally, the last straw was the effort to reestablish the Anglican church over all 13 colonies. It was that that led to our War of Independence. And quite frankly, you all are familiar with the term the Sons of Issachar. Recognize that after Saul died, or was killed in, in battle, you know, there was a period of, of dual kingdoms for about seven years. And then, finally, the all 12 tribes came together under King David. And the scripture says that the Sons of Issachar, having understanding of the times, and there were only 200 in number, but these were wise men with political savvy from a biblical worldview, and they were able to influence the others to follow David as king. And quite frankly, the pastors of the founding era were those sons of Issachar. They understood exactly what was going on and what it meant. They, under, they could see down the road. You know, in 2008, I think, when the, uh, the Supreme Court threw out Texas sodomy law, one of the justices, actually it was... Uh, uh, Justice, um, oh, good grief, um, he's, he's dead now. He's very conservative. Um, Scalia. Scalia made the statement, hey, he said, here's where it's going to lead. It's going to lead to homosexual marriage. It's going to lead to all sorts of stuff. Quite frankly, when he said that, I didn't see how, but you know what? He was right. Look where we're at now. Some 12 years later, look at where we've wound it up. Well, these pastors can see where all these actions of the king were leading. So they led in this, what was, and of course, our, our co-pastor, Brother Dan, does his great uh, presentation of John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg and the Black Robe Regiment. Well, that's what it was. This is a picture of uh, Old North Church in Boston. And the old Puritan churches, the old Anglican churches, had these elevated pulpits where the pastor would ascend to his pulpit and then in his black clerical robes every Sunday stir or inflame the people's hearts toward liberty. In fact, here is an excerpt from one of the sermons, a pastor from Boston, I think it was West Church in Boston named Jonathan Mayhew. He said this in a sermon called A Discourse Against Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Powers. He said this, the king and his coronation oath swears to exercise only such power as the Constitution or the state charters have agreed give him. And the citizen in the oath of allegiance swears only to obey in the exercise of such a power. The king is as much bound by his oath not to infringe the legal rights of the people as the people are bound to yield subjection to him. 
from whence it follows that as soon as the king sets himself up above the law, he loses the king and the tyrant. And he does to all intents and purposes unking himself by acting out of and beyond that sphere which the Constitution allows the king to move in. And in such cases, he has no more right to be obeyed than any inferior officer who acts beyond his commission. So in other words, the king was as much bound by the law as any other citizen. In fact, you all have seen this before. This came from the, uh, the website from the Library of Congress. This was an idea that was presented by John Hancock and, uh, no, I'm sorry, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson on July 4, 1776 as one of the ideas discussed for the great seal of the United States. And you see in the middle of it, you see the, the uh, Egyptian army drowning in the Red Sea. You see in the background, you see Moses and the Israelites on the seashore. And you see in the center back, the Shekinah, the pillar of a flame and the pillar of a cloud. And around the outside, it says, rebellion to tyranny is obedience to God. So on July 2nd, 1776, after much discussion, and actually after meeting for well over a year in both the First and Second Continental Congress, on July 2nd, the Congress or the Continental Congress acted on the Lee Resolution, and they voted by a 12-0 with the state of New York abstaining vote to secede from the tyranny of Great Britain. Well, that was the day that it was made official. Two days later is when all the details had been finalized and the original Declaration of Independence was signed by um, uh, 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 Thomas Jefferson and by, uh, oh, good grief, Charles Thompson. Uh, only two signatures on it. But then they came together a month later at the 1st of August for the official signing uh, of the, uh, the men that had met there in the Continental Congress. Sam Adams took the occasion to give this speech. He said, we have this day restored the sovereign. Notice the sovereign is capital S. We, in other words, we put God back in charge of our country, not King George, to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven from the rising to the setting of the sun. Let his kingdom come. So let's look at what they said as we differentiate between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution from a biblical worldview. Opening paragraph says this, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the nations or the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So they believed it was important that they testify to the world exactly what led them to the decision that they made. But also notice here in this opening paragraph, we see the mission statement for this, for this act that they did, for this new creation. To assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Thomas Jefferson stated that the justification for doing what they did was given to them by God and natural law. William Blackstone wrote a four-volume set of commentaries called Blackstone's Commentaries on Law. This was the cornerstone of American political thought at the time of our founding. And all of those phrases that we see in the Declaration isn't just poetic prose from an 18th century mind. They're actually legal terms defined in Blackstone's commentaries. And the, the laws of nature and nature's God is defined as such. Man, considered as a created being, must be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is entirely dependent upon his creator. I'm translating that into modern vernacular. Is everybody reading along with me? Very good. And consequent, or as a consequence, as man depends absolutely upon his maker, capital M, God, for everything, it is necessary that a man should in all points conform to his maker's will. Very good. This will of his maker is called the law of nature. Now, we see the law of nature in nature itself. For example, the right to defend your home. Go try to take a grizzly bear cub away from a grizzly bear mama, and you'll learn real quickly about the unalienable natural right to defend your cubs. Well, 
the specifics, so the details, God's morality, you can't necessarily see as you gaze out at a night sky. But that has been given to us, according to Blackstone, in God's revealed law or divine law, and that is found only in the Holy Scriptures. And what God has written down, no human law should be allowed to contradict. Amen. So our whole country, the whole reason that America has been exceptional up to now has been the fact that we were built upon this biblical foundation, the laws of nature and nature's God. There is truth. God has established what truth is. And you may disagree with it, but you can't change it. Men are men, women are women, right is right, wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter what man says. Ultimately, God, God's will will be done and God will be proven to be right. Well, not only did we see the mission statement in the opening paragraph, but we see our statement of faith. And you see just how spiritual this document is. First of all, that first paragraph, we saw that it says we're founded on the Bible. Then we see our statement of faith. We hold these truths to be obvious to anybody with their eyes open that all men are created equal. And they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So that's our statement of faith. We all, no such thing as civil rights, no such thing as, as black rights, rights, male rights, female rights, uh, dog rights, gay rights, but we all have unalienable rights because we are all human beings created in the image of God. Now that doesn't mean we're all going to wind up equal. Doesn't mean we all look the same. We got some people are taller than others. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have different gifts than others. We aren't all equal, but we are all equal in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the law. So our statement of faith is we are given by God unalienable rights. That means nobody or country can take those rights away from us because God has given them to us. And that to secure these rights, we see our purpose of government. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Notice the rest of that. Well, I'll go ahead and read it since we're here. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. We see an example of a bunch of people doing that right here with the Declaration of Independence as they were throwing off the tyranny of King George and establishing their own new governing system. So, they signed it, and for the support of this declaration and a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, King George didn't just sign off on this. Of course, he objected, and we ultimately had to fight a war to secure that independence that was declared on July 4th, 1776. Well, we had immediately on July 4th, we went from, or actually July 2nd, I said a moment ago, rather than 13 colonies of Great Britain, with a stroke of a pen, we became 13 sovereign states, just like France is a state, or Britain is a state, or, or uh, Germany is a state. So was Pennsylvania, so was Rhode Island, so was Massachusetts. And each state had their own state constitutions. I've shown you this before, but don't let anybody tell you that our forefathers were not devotedly Christian. You could not serve in any state legislature without professing faith in a supreme being and in the Holy Scriptures. The Constitution of Delaware said this, I do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the divine scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. Wow. Don't tell me they didn't have a solid biblical worldview. Christianity obviously was center to their existence. But we had 13 sovereign states that decided they had a better chance of surviving if they worked together to finalize their independence from Great Britain. So they entered into a confederation. Actually, it was acted uh, de facto in 1776. I think in 1781 it was officially uh, ratified. 
but it was a perpetual union, which meant that they agreed to work together with no sunset clause. And by the way, they were 13 states, 13 sovereign, independent powers working together in a firm league of friendship with each other. And in fact, after we won the War for Independence, the Treaty of Paris doesn't say Great Britain and just the United States. It says the United States and then defines the United States as these 13 free, sovereign, and independent states. Well, by 1787, there was a disagreement as to whether this system was working well, and they were afraid that it was going to collapse because you had 13 sovereign states that really uh, did not always work and play well together. And by the way, I'm not getting into whether this was the right thing or wrong thing. I'm just going to tell you what happened. But they ultimately decided to come together in Philadelphia and strengthen the Articles of Confederation. But let me ask this question. Since there is no divine right of kings, and since all men are created equal, if we were to seal off the doors to this room, and we were just going to set sail from here into perpetuity, and we were just uh, the 50 or so of us, how would we govern ourselves? Well, we would have to probably create some system of government and then vote to elect some person to serve as a, govern, of a governor. Well, that's what they did. Since there is no divine right of kings, we the people constituted or created, inaugurated, established, developed it, a limited civil government, delegated few powers to that government, by the way, specifically defined, and then pledged to submit to the proper rule of law. Not subjecting ourselves to the unlimited rule of a man or a government or men, or a king, but to be governed specifically by the law as it's written. If somebody would have just reminded Judge Gorsuch of that before he made his ruling on Monday, it would have helped. But that was what was so impressive and unique about the Mayflower Compact. There had been agreements between sovereigns and subjects before, like the Magna Carta, where a king was, was forced to sign an agreement from his lords because he had been acting like a tyrant. But there had been no other case where a group of equals just came together and decided to create their own government and then pledged to be bound by that government which they created. But that's exactly what happened on the Mayflower. Well, in 1787, we the people of the United States, in order to improve what we were offering, uh, already operating under, in order to, to form a more perfect union, they created this limited general government. They divided it into three parts. Why? Because the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked and can't be trusted. They knew how dangerous it was to concentrate power. So you had a legislative branch which was charged with making law, but by the way, they only had certain areas that they were limited that they could act in. Article 1, Section 8 divides 17 areas that Congress can act in. And by the way, even Congress was divided. You had one house which represented the people, the populace, and then you had one house which represented the states. And they together created limited laws. Then you had the president, which was elected every four years. His only responsibility was to carry out the laws that were enacted by the legislature. As a matter of fact, during the founding era of presidents, in other words, the first 36 years uh, when presidents that were alive during the founding era actually were in office, they had less than two dozen uh, executive orders or presidential vetoes because they didn't believe it was their responsibility to rule over the people. They were to carry out the acts of legislation. And quite frankly, the judicial was very limited as to what they were supposed to do. You had laws that took place at the, in the high seas or disagreements between different states or between people in different states. Most of what they do today, they don't actually have the authority to do, but they do anyway. As a matter of fact, here's what's ironic. Around the law school at Harvard, here just underneath the roof line, you've got Exodus 18 engraved. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and thou shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. In other words, that's referencing that first constitution, the law of Israel. In fact, that the judges are and the lawyers are supposed to be enforcing the written law, not just making stuff up as they go. Folks, there's nowhere where the Supreme Court can force 
the legalization of the murder of preborn children in our land. There's nowhere where the Supreme Court can just redefine marriage. There's nowhere where the Supreme Court can redefine how many genders there are. That's what's maddening about this. We've now stepped out of a very clearly black and white written world to where now we are in the postmodern era. Yeah, I, I, this is craziness. But nevertheless, that's what the Constitution gave us. And then it delegated the role and responsibility of each area of the general government. And then tacked on the Bill of Rights, just in case anybody fell asleep, wrote down 10 absolute no-go zones, which in case anybody wasn't paying attention, the federal government cannot do this. They cannot do that. They cannot touch this. Nevertheless, they're not only touching it, they're, they're doing more handling of it than Michael Jordan did in a typical basketball game. It's ridiculous what's going on. Well, I'm going to stop with just one more slide here in a moment because we've already gone 30 minutes. Where does the time go? I guarantee you somebody speeds up the clock when I'm talking. But at Constitution Hall, as they were debating this, there was a discussion about the danger of creating and giving too much power to a general government. And they reminded each other that they had just fought a war to liberate themselves from too powerful of a monarch. But they were assured that this could not happen. Why? Because the responsibilities given to the general government were clearly spelled out in the Constitution. And the general government couldn't possibly overstep their limited authority because everything was written down very clearly, couldn't possibly be misunderstood. In fact, before the Constitution was accepted, it had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. And New York was a prime, big battleground. And there was a question as to whether it was going to be accepted or not. And what are called the Federalist Papers today were actually letters written and published in the New York papers to the average everyday citizen trying to convince them to ratify the Constitution. These letters were written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and um, uh, James Madison. Uh, and Federalist 45 said this, addressing this particular question. The powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. And I promise you, none of them give the Supreme Court authority to redefine what a man and a woman is. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former, being the federal government, will be exercised principally on external objects such as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce, with which last the power of taxation will, for the most part, be connected. The powers reserved to the individual states will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. In other words, the operation of the federal government will be most extensive and important in times of war and danger, those of the state governments in times of peace and security. Folks, there is no way that they could possibly misunderstand the Constitution, except that we're sitting here and we're watching them misunderstand the Constitution by supposedly legal experts of our day. Well, here was supposed to be the safety measure. By the way, this was exactly why we did our, our Tenth Amendment issue back in 2015, trying to end abortion uh, in the state of Oklahoma using medical licensing standards. This is why uh, Pastor... Fisher was running for the office of governor because he's one of the few people that understand this. But whenever the federal government oversteps its area of responsibility, it was supposed to be up to the state to say no and draw the line. Thomas Jefferson wrote this in 1798. He said that the individual states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to their general government, but that by a compact called the Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution, a general government for specific purposes delegated to that government certain definite powers, reserving each state to itself 
the residuary mass of rights to their own self-government, and that whenever the federal government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are illegal, unauthoritative, void, and unenforceable. And it's up to the states to say that. James Madison, who was known by some as the father of the Constitution, said this, in case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of powers not granted by the Constitution to the federal government, the states who came together to create the federal government have the right, or in fact are bound by duty, to interpose to arrest the progress of the evil and for maintaining within their respective limits, it's up to each state to defend the citizens of its own state, the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. Now, where did we come up with this idea of writing down and defining a limited constitution? You all know from the Bible, long before, in fact, 400 years before Israel was dumb enough to ask for a king, God gave them instruction for what they would do when they did. Moses wrote this in Deuteronomy 17. Yet when that day came, the king, before he took his position, and before he took his throne, he was take a copy of the law as the Levites were entrusted with keeping it. And he was supposed to write it out by longhand. And he was supposed to refer to it daily that he may know it like the back of his hand and keep all the words of this law and these statutes and do them. And even the king was not allowed to deviate from what the written constitution had to say. He legally couldn't turn to his right or turn to his left. He was limited to govern only in accordance with the constitution. That's where our founding fathers came up with this wacky, crazy idea of writing it down and then actually being bound by it. And that's why, as we saw earlier, when Jonathan Mayhew, that one pastor I showed you that excerpt from early on in this presentation, he said when the king violates his oath to keep the Constitution, then it's not a legal act, and we are not bound to follow him because we are only bound to keep the law. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what this says. So, by the way, we're just going to skip past this because we're out of time, but understand this. Look at, all this. Look at how far I thought I was going to go. My goodness. I always have high hopes. The Declaration is our mission statement. It's our Declaration of Faith. It's our nation's birth certificate. The Constitution is the operations manual. The Constitution created this limited general government, assigned certain specific powers to it, and then said which branch of the government was responsible for what. By the way, where did they get that idea? From Israel and the law, the Constitution of Israel. By the way, what did God say to Saul when Saul usurped his area of responsibility and stepped over into the area of the priesthood and offered sacrifices? What did God do to Saul? Jerk the kingdom from him. Because God believed, even with Israel, there was a separation of powers in that constitutional republic. That's exactly where our forefathers came up with the idea. The Declaration established the purpose of government. The Constitution establishes the practice of government. So the Constitution, by its very nature, being our birth certificate and mission statement, a statement of faith, is very spiritual. The Constitution is not as much. It's very practical. However, it still defines the Lord's Day as the Lord's Day and our year of the Lord as the year of the Lord. So from their worldview, that was itself was very biblical in stating we are calling to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bear witness and from whom we get our authority and source of power. So recognize that we have our foundation, the Declaration of Independence upon it, is the Constitution, and upon it, our country stands. At least, it has up until now. God willing, it will continue to until the rapture. But we'll see. As you've heard me say before, 
God is not dependent upon the United States of America for him to stay in business. God's still on the throne, and I can assure you he's not worried. I got to tell you, I'm worried. But pastor, the Bible says to be anxious for nothing. Yeah, yeah, I know, I've read that part too. I just can't help it. I'm flesh. This is one, this is one area of weakness I'm struggling with right now. But um, God is not the least bit worried. God is not going to go out of business if America falters. But America will go out of business if we forget this. That's why it's so important. Now, folks, i got to tell you, I'm encouraged. And you guys understand what's going on out there. But how many of you have heard that there were over a million people that have made reservations or wanted to get tickets to President Trump being up in Tulsa? i got to tell you, because of the liberal control of social media and the national secular media and everything else, the average everyday person just wants to keep their head down and avoid catching a stray bullet. Now, I mean that metaphorically. But I can promise you, when they answer a survey, they might say, they might say one thing, but it seems like, as we saw in 2016, come election day, the other side might be in for a big surprise. Now, I've got to tell you, what's that? As long as we don't vote from our phone. That's exactly right. Let me tell you, we need to work as hard as we can. We also need to pray as hard as we can because we need a, we need a direct intervention from heaven because the, um, the, uh, as we are going to be blessed with some great speakers over the next couple of months that are experts on the Marxist strategy. Folks, we are following it to the letter for what's going on in our country right now. And uh, as we said Sunday, the issue is not the issue. The issue is the revolution. And they are doing the best they can to create contention in our country. Because when there is a time of contention, that's when they can create change. And that's what the whole goal is. We go against the world system. We are the exception to the rule. And then Mr. Make America Great Again was an exceptional president compared to what the norm has been. So they are working feverishly to try to get us back on course. So I pray that that doesn't happen. I pray that we see God be merciful to us again politically because, uh, as I've said before, um, we won't lose our salvation if we lose our freedom, but we might lose our freedom, and I like our freedom. I, I don't want to start a prison ministry from the inside. I'd rather support a prison ministry from out here, all right?